Thanks for checking out one of our messages online. My name is Caleb Combs, and I'm the gathering pastor here at the River. We would love to connect with you. Simply texting River Connect with no space to 97000, or you can visit our website, theriverchurch.cc, for more information. If you'd like to financially support the River Church, you can do that by texting an amount you'd like to give to 84321, or you can visit our website again and click the giving tab. We hope you enjoy and are challenged by the message today, and we hope to see you soon. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. If you have a Bible, I'm going to ask you to please open it up to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 9. And that's where we're going to be here in just a moment. I want to welcome all of you who are watching online this morning as well. I want to thank you for joining us, being a part of the gathering this morning. I want to read uh, just one verse, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to ask the Lord to speak, okay? Let's do that. John chapter 9, verse 25, it says, He answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness your love, your faithfulness. I pray that this morning, Lord, you would bless the teaching of your word. I pray that, Lord, you alone would speak. I pray that, Lord, you would move and that you would work. We thank you, Lord, for your word. It is alive. Jesus, we look to you this morning. for You alone have the words of life. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us so much. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I want to ask you, uh, how do we save the world? How do we save our country? How do we save the world? This is a question um, I feel like I'm being asked fairly regularly at this point. It might be something that you're asking. Have you been asking yourself this? Like, what do we do? With everything that's going on, what do we do, right? I'm going to make a few statements here this morning. They're not political. They are theological, they are biblical, they are moral. I have no interest in political matters. It's the state of where things are at right now in our country. And I want to ask you, do you see what's happening? It's happening very, very quickly. It is a rapid decline. And it is unfolding very quickly before our eyes. Uh, When you look around, every area of our society is under attack. It is no exaggeration, it is not dramatic to say that every good thing is is being denied, despised, and defamed. And every destructive thing is being held up, it's being promoted and encouraged and celebrated. From the constant promotion of silly things, like gambling on every, every commercial you see, to the legalization of drug use and the ability to buy it every 20 feet, to the continual stream of sexual immorality that is being pushed through every form of entertainment and media, to the 50 years of blood on our hands. What do I mean? referring to the murder of children, which is legal so long as they are in the womb. And even when we have a state like Texas that tries to overturn and protect life, passing the heartbeat bill, we have an administration that immediately condemns that protection and begins, quote-unquote, to work overtime to overturn it. Every design of God is under attack The family is under attack like never before, with the vast majority of children growing up in broken homes or blended families. Gender is under attack as nearly every child growing up now is continually barraged with the idea that they might not be what God originally created them to be. 
LGBTQ has been extended, and I am not joking when I say it's been extended to be LGBTQ, TTQQIIAA+, it keeps going, because every child is being told to not only explore, it is being encouraged to reject the idea of a fixed gender, they are being continually told that it is a fluid thing. And so my daughter goes to school with kids who change their pronouns every day to no longer be him or her, but even now it. It It's so tragic for my daughter to tell me that as one girl referring to herself as a possession. Parents are bringing untold abuse against their children as they put them through legalized gender reassignment therapies. They're being heralded as champions of freedom to do so. History is being erased and rewritten before our eyes as teachers indoctrinate our children with every form of humanistic nonsense at every grade level. And as they do, they too are being celebrated and promoted. While teachers who are teaching a God-centric, Bible-centric worldview and biblical morals are being mocked, persecuted, and fired. We're being told that we are racists at our core to make us hate each other to divide us from each other because the enemy knows a house divided cannot stand. At the helm of all of this, besides Satan himself, are people who hate God. They do. They hate God. They hate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And by the way, they hate you. And they are the ones who get to lead and make decisions. And they are the ones who every single day get to get in front of cameras or on their computers and tell us, quote unquote, the news. Through TV, internet, social media, apps, newspapers, magazines, music, and podcasts, they hate God, they mock God, and they mock truth. And we listen to them for some reason because they are self-proclaimed experts. They lie, twist, and distort the truth all day, every day to get us to love the wrong things, hate the wrong things, fear the wrong things, believe the wrong things so that we will do the wrong things and make the wrong choices. They work tirelessly to push the agenda of their father, who Jesus said his only goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. They push us away from each other to distance ourselves, to isolate us, all while we stare into screens instead of into the eyes of other people. And now, many of you are worried that you're going to lose your job because your company is forcing you to take a vaccine or to adhere to policies or whatever it might be that you cannot go along with. And we could go on and on, couldn't we? The world isn't getting better. It's not. It's getting worse. And we know this according to Scripture. We do not have uh, hopelessness as believers. We know how this plays out. We know what the end is. I was talking to someone this week. I've spent a lot of time in the Gospel of John because it reminds me that Jesus is the true King. And he is in control. I've spent a lot of time in the Psalms because it's highly emotional. And it ministers to me. And I've spent a lot of time in the book of Revelation so that I'm reminded of how it all ends. So what do we do? How do we save the world? The answer is, please hear me, the answer is the same as it's always been. How do we save the world? The answer is this, one life at a time. One person at a time. To show you that this morning, I had you turn to John chapter 9. We find here Jesus is walking through, as we come into John John chapter 9, Jesus is walking through the very busy city of Jerusalem. We read this in verse 1. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. A few things to notice here. One, this is a man who has been blind his entire life. This is not temporary blindness. He was born blind. He was born in the dark. His eyes did not work from birth. He has never seen anything. And as such, this man would have a hard time supporting himself in that day and age. D.A. Carson said it like this, a congenital... A uh, congenitally bo- uh, blind man was unlikely to be able to support himself by any other means than begging. And this man had never seen anything. My own father and, uh, and my uncle were born with sight, but went blind by the time they were teenagers. Not this man. This man has never seen anything. 
the multitude of necessary components that are needed to see either never developed or never began to function. And the purpose of telling us that this man has been blind since birth is telling us that in human terms, this is a permanent situation. Now, the second thing to notice here is this. Jesus noticed this man. This man did not see Jesus, but Jesus saw him. I'm always amazed by verses like this, where Jesus sees one person in the middle of a crowd of people. My wife and I, a couple of years ago, we were in the very busy marketplace of Jerusalem. And uh, I mean, I can't imagine if you told me to find you know, an individual person, how long it would take me to find that person. I mean, they're just people and vendors and animals and food and, I mean, just everything, everywhere. And Jesus notices one person who is blind. Incredible. But it tells us something that is extremely encouraging this morning. He sees you. He knows your need. He sees me. In the midst of all that's going on, in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the the crowd and everything else, you know, I've met people who sometimes have this idea that, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go to the Lord with my problem, not until it's really big. I don't wanna like bother him. He's got a lot going on. He's really busy. I don't wanna bother the Lord. I've got like two prayers, you know, and I, I gotta save them for when it really counts. It's like, no, 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 no. That's a misunderstanding of who God is. In the midst of all that's going on, God sees you. He understands what you're going through. When we are hurting, He sees. When we are in pain, when we are suffering, when we are confused, when we are afraid, He understands and sees and knows and cares. Now, in verse 2, we see a common misconception. Look at verse 2. And His disciples asked Him, About this man, he says, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Again, this is a misunderstanding of who God is. It's really an odd question from the disciples because here's what they're asking. They're asking if the man sinned so that he would be born blind. That's kind of weird, right? Because how could he sin before he was born? They probably had in their minds the idea that this man would sin in some way in his lifetime, and God knew that, and so struck the man with blindness. The other alternative in their mind is that the parents must have been the ones who sinned, and so the man was born blind. Here's what Jesus says, no, just flat out, nope, that's not it. We, we so often have these misunderstandings, right? If we're honest, we so often think these things, these kind of thoughts go through our head. Lord, is this thing happening because you're punishing me? You ever thought that? God, are you punishing me? Did I get the raise because I've been faithfully attending church? Did I not get the raise because I missed a Sunday? On a more serious note, was my son born with autism because I did something wrong? Did my parent die because I did something sinful? We can go on and on, right? These are the kind of thoughts that come into our minds. I want to be very delicate here because this is extremely important to understand. Listen, while it is true that sin brings its own consequences, let me me explain that a little bit, right? If you steal and get caught, you're going to go to jail comes with its own consequence, right? If we do drugs, we're going to do damage to our bodies and to our lives. Sin brings its own consequences. It has its own issues, its own penalties that come with it. It's always destructive. And also, while it's also true that the world generally has suffering and pain and trouble because sin is in it, right? Meaning sin is in the world in general, and it's affecting the whole world, right? Obviously, before sin entered the world, we didn't have disease or blindness or suffering or anything like that, right? So in a general sense, sin is causing all that we deal with today. That's true. But it is not true 
that every person suffering is doing so because of personal sin. That is not true. It's not true that someone has cancer because they have sinned and God has struck them with cancer. It's not true that someone was born blind because they will sin at some point in their lifetime and God knows that and so struck them with blindness. A child is not born with Down syndrome because his parents are sinners. Hear this. We live in a broken world, a world that has disease and death and disasters and pain. Again, there may be situations where sin causes something tragic to happen. My own father was killed uh, by drinking and driving. Uh, He and his friend were both killed uh, in that car. It was the result of what they were doing. But it was not God's judgment against them. It was the result of their own sin, right? A a family who has lost a child is not being punished for wrongdoing. A tornado or an earthquake is not the result of the judgment of God against them, the place that this is happening in, God is judging. You say, well, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? God rained down fire from heaven on them. And what about the flood? God caused that. Yes, those are very specific instances where God declared His judgment ahead of time And they served as examples to us of the extent of the wickedness of mankind. The idea here that God is trickling out His judgment on man, you know, for every person, for what they have done or not done, is both a misunderstanding of who God is and also of what His Word says. The Bible is very clear that God is storing up wrath for a day. It is a very specific day. It is a day when God will judge all things and all people. It's not being poured out continually on mankind. This explains, by the way, why the wicked often is is in a place of authority and prospers financially, right? Prospers in so many different ways. The psalmist Asaph had difficulty with this. He had trouble with this in Psalm 74, do you remember? In verse 2 of Psalm 74, here's what Asaph said. He said, but as for me... My feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, look what he says, for there are no pains in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish for. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Oh man, how many people fit into this category today? He goes on in verse 12 and says, Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Then he says this, he makes this conclusion, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. He says, Has it even been beneficial for me to follow the ways of the Lord? It seems like if I were to follow wickedness, I would prosper. I would not have such great difficulty. You ever thought this? Verse 16, this is what he says. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. He said, surely you, God, you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. The wicked of this world, we say, man, how are they prospering? How are they allowed to continue? How are they allowed to do what they're doing? Understand something. They have an end. And the end is coming. And the end is judgment for the wicked leaders of the nations and those who take advantage of others. That day is coming, but it is not here yet. Again, the New Testament is clear that these are days of God's mercy and days of God's grace, His kindness towards mankind. I want to be clear, while sin can and does bring its own consequences, not all tragedy is some punishment from God. So Jesus says this, look at verse 3, Jesus answered, neither. He said, no, (laughs) neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now again, I want to be clear, I want to be careful, 
It does not mean that this man was given blindness so that God could show his power through him. It means that God is going to take what has happened to this man and show his power through it. And that's what's it's, that's what's about to happen. Look at verse 4. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is being really clear. The way people see is through him. He is the light of the world. Otherwise, the Bible is clear, we walk in darkness. And look what he does now in verse 6. When he had said these things, he spit on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, all the germaphobes in the room are like, seriously? Um, could we just maybe use some purified water? Jesus, we've got a little bottle of Dasani here. If you could just maybe pour that. And maybe, we, maybe some untouched dirt would be helpful, you know? No, Jesus spit into the dirt that a million people have walked in. Camels and horses and animals and everything else, right? And he made mud. <laughs> you say, why did Jesus spit into the dirt and why did he make mud? Well, some have suggested, I think this is an interesting suggestion, some have suggested that the man had no eyeballs. Since we were made of dirt, the idea is Jesus literally formed eyeballs. He would need them <laughs> to be able to see. Jesus formed eyeballs within this man's head. That's an interesting thought. Others have suggested that it was Jesus using common things to do something that is miraculous. And I think that gets more at the idea of what's happening here. Listen, the spit and the dirt making mud, here's what it immediately says. The dirt ain't special. That's what it immediately says, isn't it? If Jesus had just taken a clump of dirt from the ground and smeared it into the guy's eyes, and then suddenly the guy was able to see, you know what would have happened, right? You would be able to go on Amazon today and buy the dirt from that region. That's what would happen. They'd be collecting it, bottling it, right? Like the dirt, <laughs> the dirt, the healing, the miracle dirt. That's what would have happened. People would have bottled it and sold it. But this man could not have just taken dirt from the ground and rubbed it into his eyes and been able to see. It is clear from the story that it is the one who is doing this that is special. It's not the dirt. Not to be crass, but it's his spit, <laughs> right? not the dirt. It's his words. It's him. It's Jesus that made this happen. By the way, this is not the only time that Jesus did this. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse, you can read these later, but Mark chapter 7, verse 33, and Mark chapter 8, verse 23, Jesus applies spit directly to the man's eyes, right? So Jesus tells him, verse 7, and he said to him, go now and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent, so he went and washed, and look what happens. Came back seeing. Don't want to read too quickly over that. I want you to see what happens here. Jesus kneels down next to this man, spits into the dirt. Okay, this, this guy can't see anything. Okay, so Jesus kneels down next to him, spits into the dirt, makes some mud, picks it up, and begins to wipe it into the man's eyes. What was that like? Oh, what is happening, right? Like, what are you doing? And then he heard the words, go wash in the pool. And for some reason, the man obeys. Stands up, feels his way along, or maybe someone's helping him. He's got to get to the pool of Siloam. But can you imagine what happened when he washed that mud away? Suddenly, colors start to flood in. Light, shapes, depth, beauty, sight. Do you think he might have been dancing in the pool of Siloam there for a few minutes? I mean, just so excited. Sight. It says, right, he, he came back seeing. And this time, right, he, he walks back unassisted. He sees the path and he sees the faces and, and he sees it all. And he is no doubt coming back to find the man who did this, right? Who 
wiped mud in my eyes. But of course, he doesn't know what Jesus looks like because he didn't see Jesus when Jesus was wiping mud into his eyes. So he doesn't even know who he's looking for. So he encounters other people. Look at this verse 8. Therefore the neighbors and those who had previously seen that he was blind, they came to him. Here's what they said. Is not this he who sat and begged? They see him and they can't believe what they are now seeing. Wait, isn't this the guy who was begging? Isn't this the guy who was blind just moments ago? The responses are pretty funny. Look at verse 9. Some said, yeah, that, that's him. Others said, no, no, that, that, it's like him. I'm sorry, what? No, he just, he looks a lot like him. What? I thought D.A. Carson, he, he said it, it was pretty funny. He said, some found it easier to believe that the blind man had somehow disappeared and the fellow before them was someone else, someone who bore a remarkable resemblance to their blind neighbor. He looks a lot like him. Can't be the same guy. But the healed man sets the record straight. Verse 9, he said, I am he. <laughs> no, it's me. So they begin to ask. Look at verse 10. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? This is why we're talking about it this morning. This is why this is our passage on reaching the world this morning. Because when people see what Jesus has done in you, they begin to wonder, they begin to ask, they begin to question. And to this man, they say this, how did this happen? What has happened in your life? We knew you when you were like this. What has happened? How is it that you are able to see? And the man answers the question in the only way that he can. Look at this, verse 11. He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. So he did enough research to find out that the person who wiped dirt in his eyes was Jesus. Okay? Then he says, Jesus made this clay, he anointed my eyes, told me to wash, I did it, and I received my sight. Take a look at what this man did. He told what he knew. That's all he did. We sometimes think we have to know a lot to tell people about Jesus. This guy, not a Hebrew scholar, not a theologian, not a teacher. He didn't know the gospel. He didn't even know Jesus yet. Hadn't even seen him yet. But here, he tells what he knows. And this tells us something. We don't have to be theologians to tell others about what Jesus has done for us. We all have some version of this story to tell. We all have some version to say, this is what I was and this is what it meant. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus, he, he came and this is what he did. And now I see. It's so simple. And here's the thing. It's undeniable. It's undeniable. Everybody in this story is wanting to deny it, but the guy can see. And the people in your life, they want to deny it, but you're a different person. And so it's undeniable. And it causes people to look at Jesus. And that's what it did here. Look at verse 12. Very next things out of their mouth. Very next words. Here's what they say. Then they said to him, where is he? You see what happened? Where is Jesus? You're talking about this one who did this. Where is he? We want to know where Jesus is. Where do we find him? That's funny to ask the blind guy where Jesus is. Which way did he go? Seriously? But listen, this is the power of you telling his story in your life. Not your story. It's not your story. It's his story in your life. Your story is everything before him. And it's sad. His story 
is where the power is, right? It exalts him. If it points to him, people look to him. Notice that this man, the story that he told was not about himself. Please notice this, okay? How do you tell your story? This story was not about himself. It wasn't, well, you know, uh, what happened to you? Well, I was sitting there one day, and I thought, you know, i got to do something to change my life. I need to take some steps to change things. And uh, along came a guy, and I said, hey, you know what, would you just say a prayer for me? And uh, then, then I, you know, he said a prayer for me, and then I went down to the pool, and I washed my eyes a little bit in faith. And I've got strong faith, brother, so I came back seeing. You say, that's ridiculous. Yeah, but I hear a lot of people's stories, and sometimes this is what they sound like. They sound like they did God a favor. They sound like they are the ones who rescued themselves. They are the hero of their own story. And I just roll my eyes because I know it's not true. Not this guy, right? His story, look what his story begins with. It begins with the words, a man called Jesus. Start right there. (laughs) The story begins and ends with Jesus, right? A man called Jesus. This is what he did. And notice he says, and I received sight. The word received there means it was a gift that was given to me. In other words, the man doesn't think that he brought about sight in his life. The story is all about Jesus. Jesus gave him sight. That's how simple our story is. And so his friends say, where is Jesus? Here's what he says in verse 12. I don't know. I don't know where he is. He hadn't found Jesus yet. He was trying to, but he hadn't found him. He didn't know where he was, right? He was looking for Jesus, but couldn't find him. Then his friends do something that actually causes some trouble for him. I don't know how great of friends they really are, but look at verse 13. They brought him who formerly, I love that, who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Not sure why they thought it was a a good idea, but they needed apparently to get an official ruling on the whole situation. So they bring this guy to the Pharisees to kind of like confirm what's happened. Verse 14, now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. That's an important detail because Jewish law forbid on the Sabbath any work, and by the way, that included healing for some weird reason. And what Jesus does here will be a point of contention for these religious leaders. It it, it shows the contrast between the Lord and the religious leaders. The religious leaders, they're all about keeping rules. Jesus cares about people. You'll see as the story goes, they don't care at all that the guy can see. They don't care. That doesn't doesn't excite them. That doesn't bless them. They're not excited about that. that. That makes no difference. Their point of contention is Jesus and him breaking their law. Verse 15. Then the Pharisees also asked him again. So they asked the blind man again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. How many of you really like repeating yourself? Just a question. Your kids, you say something, and then they say what, and you repeat it, and then what? Now we have a problem right? (laughs) Like, I'm good for one, one full repeat. Three repeats, I can't handle it. You know what I mean? Like, here's the guy, right? He's he's being asked, what happened? This is what happened. What happened? I told you what happened. And ask me again, it's going to be a problem, right? Like, here he is, right? So, they said, what happened, right? So, they asked him, he says, he put clay on my eyes, I wash and I see. Verse 16, They come to this conclusion about Jesus, because the story is still about Jesus. Verse 16, therefore some of the Pharisees said, this man, they're talking about Jesus now, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. You see, the story is about Jesus. How can he be from God if he doesn't keep the rules? But others said, verse 16, others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them concerning Jesus. There were others who were, they were not so quick to dismiss Jesus, and this is what the subject of Jesus does, right? You've seen this. It divides. Some of your family accepts him. Some of your family rejects him. Some wonder about him. Some hate him. 
but everyone has to deal with him. Everyone has to deal with him. Now again, they, they do not seem to care at all that this man who was born blind has sight. They only question, the only question is who and what and how did this happen? So they go back to the man, look at this, verse 17. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? What do you say about Jesus because he opened your eyes? What do you say that he is? And he said, uh, he's a prophet. It's funny because they're asking a formerly blind man who he thinks Jesus is. And his answer is, he must be some form of prophet. And he, and he, and he does that because apparently he's got some biblical understanding and he knows that the prophets of old were the ones who did stuff like this, right? Elijah and Elisha, right? Miracles and things of healing and raising people from the dead and all this stuff, right? So he's like, in his mind, he's got to be a prophet because he, he can't do things like this as a normal person. That, that's what's happening here. But that's no good for the Pharisees. They would much rather that this guy said he's some sort of magician, He's a magician. He's a soothsayer. He does this. He does that. They would have loved that. They would have said, oh, that, that's great. Yeah, no problem. Case dismissed. <laughs> but because this man is saying that he is a prophet from God, that's the very thing they're trying to deny. And it's the same in our world today. People are happy to think about Jesus as a good teacher, as a moral example or even as the leader of the religion of Christianity. But God himself? No way. From God, risen from the dead, alive forever, the one true God, the judge, the king, the only one? No, can't be. So look at verse 18. But the Jews did not believe, it says, concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. So this gets even better. So someone, no doubt, in the group suggested that this was all just a big hoax. Listen, listen, okay? You guys are getting all worked up. It's very simple. The man was never blind in the first place. This is a stunt. It's a sideshow. He's just trying to gain a following. We can easily dismiss this. Go get his parents, so they find the man's parents, which tell us that this was all happening right there. They all lived in that area, right? It was happening locally. They go get the man's parents, verse 19, and they ask them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? They're like, well, well what did we say? What? You know, I don't remember saying anything, right? Is this your son, whom you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? So three questions there. Is this your son? Was he really born blind? And how is it that he can see? Verse 20, his parents. They don't have much of a backbone, these, these parents here. Look at verse 20. His parents answered them and said, well, we know this is our son. And yes, he was born blind. But here's where they get a little, a little soft, right? Verse 21. But by what means he now sees, we don't know. <laughs> right? Or who opened his eyes? Wait, how do you know someone opened his eyes? Oh, that's right, you know the story. You just don't want to say it. Or who opened his eyes? Uh, we don't know. He is of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. <laughs> you say, why are they so nervous? Well, we don't have to guess about that. We're told, verse 22, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, that Jesus was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. Listen, uh, talk to him. I don't, we don't know. Talk to him. We don't want to get kicked out of our church. Listen, again, this is what the issue of Jesus does, doesn't it? In your family, isn't this what, it, isn't this what happens? You've experienced this. Jesus necessarily divides. It's what happens. This man is ready and willing to confess Jesus as Christ and to talk about him. His parents, not at all. And Jesus said this. He said this would happen. Jesus said this, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. 
Right? In other words, I did not come to bring everybody together. There's not this big, you know, Jesus comes and it unifies the whole world under him. That's not what Jesus said would happen. Quite the opposite, Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Now, don't misunderstand that. Jesus is not talking about war or fighting. He's talking about division. A sword divides. And that's why Jesus goes on the very next verse. It says, for I have come... And a man will be set against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Meaning, one of them is going to know the Lord. One of them is not. And they're going to be divided from each other over the most important issue that could possibly be uh, dealt with, right? Husbands and wives and children, they're, they're going to be separated over this issue of Jesus And who he is and what he did. And this happens here with this man and with his parents. He is ready to confess Christ. They are not. So they go back to the man. They've gotten what they need from the parents. So they go back to the man. Here's what they say, verse 24. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Now they don't even care about him being blind or being healed. Now it's just about Jesus. They're irritated. And they say, Give God the glory. Which is like saying, you are on oath before God. Raise your hand. Put your hand on the Bible. Tell us, this man, this Jesus is a sinner. We know it. You just need to say it. And uh, by the way, the, the this man part is derogatory. They're trying to defame Jesus. And they're saying, this man, this this man who is nothing more than that, he's just a sinner. He's a lawbreaker. And we need you just to say it so that everybody else can go. We can all go on about our day. We can dismiss what has happened and move on. Well, though they're laying the pressure on pretty thick, I love that this guy doesn't back down. I love it. He's got some spirit, this guy. I love it. Look what it says, verse 25. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I I do not know. I, I don't know that. One thing I know, that though I was blind... Now I see. The man doesn't know much about Jesus. He really doesn't. But he does know what Jesus did. I was blind. Now I see. And that is the point I am wanting to make this morning. We can all tell this story. What do I mean? You don't have to know what the entire Bible says to tell this story. You don't have to know the answers to every person's question to tell this story. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't learn. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't grow. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't know the gospel. You should. Absolutely. We absolutely have to do this. We must do this. But what it means is that if you have come to Christ, if you've encountered Him and He has changed you, then you have a story to tell others right now. You don't have to wait. In fact, please don't wait. As we have shown at the beginning of this, of our time together, Your family, your friends, your neighbors, the world cannot afford for us to wait any longer. It's very simple. The story is how he changed you. That's it. What is your I was blind, but now I see story? What is it? What's yours? Can you share that with someone? Can you tell someone that? If they came to you and they said, hey, what happened to you? Can you tell them? Well, uh, I made some changes. I started going to church. Start with, Jesus did this. Jesus did this. I was blind, now I see. Man, How about this? Man, I was walking my own way. I was doing my own thing. I had no hope, no peace, no joy. I was empty, but now I'm full. I was searching for someone to really love me. Looked in all the wrong places, found nothing but pain and brokenness. I was searching, but now I have found. So simple. I was lost, but now I've been found. I was at the end of my rope. I thought about taking my life. I tried everything to fill the hole in my heart and in my life. I was dead and now I am alive. What's your version of this? Can I encourage you as an exercise to sit down today and write out yours? What were you? What are you? And what happened? 
so that you could share this with someone. I think it's unreasonable to think that we'll just know exactly what to say when the situation arises without ever going through it. You might think, well, what's my story going to do for anybody? My story is, I grew up in Sunday school, and I never did anything bad. I didn't smoke, I didn't chew, I didn't go with those who do, right? I haven't watched a rated R movie in my entire lifetime. Never done anything bad. What's my story going to do? You were still dead. You were still blind. You were still lost. And now, you're alive, and you see, and you're found. It's very important. Say, what's my story going to do? Well, I remind you, what happened when this man, who knew nothing shared what Jesus did for him. What happened? People asked him what happened. Then people asked him who did it. Then they were asking where Jesus was. You see the progression here. Then they talked about Jesus, and each person was confronted with Jesus. In short, many people were affected by Jesus who would have otherwise just gone about their day had this not happened. The point I'm making is you don't have to have all the answers. It is okay to say what this man said. I don't know. I don't know about that. But this is what I do know. I was dead, and I'm alive. I was lost, and I am found. I was empty, and I am full. I was blind, but now I see. We said it earlier, this cannot be denied. It wasn't by the religious leaders. They couldn't deny as much as they wanted to that the man wasn't blind anymore. And the same is true for you. They may not like how you've been saved, but they can't deny that you are, and they have to deal with Jesus. So the story goes on. It's pretty funny. Look at this, verse 26. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? (laughs) How did he open your eyes? Oh, dear Lord. Verse 27. He answered and said to them, I told you already, and and you did not listen Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become one of his disciples? I love this guy. He's great. Did you want to follow Jesus too? I can tell you how. I love this guy. He's great. They fire back at him, verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, by the way, this is probably what's happened to you, right? When you try and tell your family about Christ, then they revile you, defame you, right? So they don't have to deal with truth. They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. Here what they're saying is, they're true followers of God, but this man has been deceived. He's following a deceiver. Your family ever tell you that? You've been deceived? You've lost it? You don't have, you're following a fairy tale? You ever hear that? Verse 29, they make it clear what they think. Verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he is from. In other words, they're calling Jesus a deceiver. They're saying he's actually from hell. And they're calling this man a fool for following Jesus. But man, I love this guy. He doesn't back down at all. Look at this, verse 30. Then the man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. And yet he has opened my eyes Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, He hears Him. Since the world began, it is unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He took them to church. I love it. Now the short paragraph reveals what he knows about God, and and to be honest, not much. In fact, some of what he says isn't actually accurate. He says God doesn't hear sinners. That's not true. God does, otherwise nobody would be able to be saved. But the overall point he's making is absolutely true. Only God opens the eyes of the blind. Only God opens the ears of those who are deaf. Only God raises a paralyzed person from their bed onto their feet. Only God raises the dead. People can't do this, only God. And they were ignoring the fact that was right in front of them. They were starting with the idea that Jesus is nothing and trying to explain it from there. And that's what our world does It's what the unsaved person does. They deny Christ and then try to explain things. Well, these guys don't like this uneducated man. They don't like that he just took them to church, and so they viciously fire back at him. Verse 34, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins, and you, 
and, and excuse me, and are you teaching us? And then they threw him out. Wow. What they say to this man shows so clearly what they think about themselves. They think they're righteous. And this is the thing about all unsaved people. They think they're fine. They think they're righteous. They think they're okay. They think they are fine. But you know what? Saved people, we know we're not. We know we're not fine. We know we're not okay. We know we need to be saved. This is the vast and drastic difference. The unsaved does not see their need to be saved. They think this man, they, they think he's completely born in sins. That he is below them. You're teaching us. And then they throw him out. And again, this is what the subject of Jesus does. Forces people to deal with him, with who he is and what he did. And as we see here, it does not mean that your family is going to receive Christ. But it does mean they'll have to deal with him. It doesn't mean your neighbors are going to receive Christ, but it does mean they'll have to deal with him. And hear this, they might receive him. That might happen. And I love what happens next. Look at verse 35. So they throw this guy out, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. They had thrown him out. And when he had found him, when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? Jesus came to the man. He found him. The man could not find Jesus, but Jesus found him. I love it. Comes looking for him, finds him, and asks him, says, now he doesn't even know, doesn't know who he is yet, but Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of God? The man answers, verse 36, look at this, he's so ready. He answered and said, who is he, Lord? That, that I may believe in him. Who, who is this one that you're speaking of? The man was ready. He was willing to believe. His heart was ready. And I love Jesus' words to him. Verse 37, and Jesus said to him, you have both seen him. You've seen him. And it is he who is talking with you. Was Jesus smiling when he looked into his eyes and said, you're looking at him with those brand new eyes of yours you are finally seeing. I love it, man. I love it. I know this man's face lit up. Right in this moment, I know that happened. I know the man, he began to, he began to, to, to celebrate what happened. He began to worship Jesus. That's what it says, verse 38. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And it says he worshiped him. What a beautiful scene this must have been because the word worship there is a word that means to bow and to kiss. Can you imagine as he just jumps and hugs Jesus and begins to kiss Jesus on his face? What a beautiful scene this must have been. So thankful, not just for sight, not just for opening his physical eyes, but for spiritual sight. That's what happened that day, right? The man was not just healed physically, he was healed spiritually. He was born again. Verse 39, it says, And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world. That those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. What is Jesus saying? Those who know they don't see are going to see. Those who know that they're lost are going to be found. Those who know that they're sinners are going to be forgiven. Those who know they need to be rescued are the ones who are going to be saved. But those who think they have no sin, like my grandfather, who I beg to come to Christ... He sees no need and thinks he's okay. And nothing could be further from the truth. Those who think they see will be lost. And Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, very religious people. Verse 40, then some of the Pharisees who were with him, they heard these words and they said to him, Are we blind also? Are you calling us blind, Jesus? Verse 41, here's what Jesus said to them. If you were blind, in other words, if you knew you were blind, you would have no sin. Your sin would be forgiven. But now you say, we see, therefore, your sin remains. And I say that this morning. The Pharisees did not see themselves as blind, and so they were. They saw themselves as seeing, as understanding, as knowing, as I got things figured out, I'm pretty good, me and the Lord, we got an understanding. No, you don't. No, you don't. The only understanding is that we are sinners separated from God because of our sin and we deserve judgment. 
And unless God extends mercy, we will be separated from him forever. But if they had seen themselves as they actually were, as blind and as ignorant and as lost, they could have turned to Christ and been saved forever. And this is the issue with every person who remains unsaved. They think they're fine. They think they're good. They think they understand. They think they see. Many people today with physical sight are more blind than this man was because they don't see. But listen, it can all change. And this is how we change the world. It's one person at a time. It's your neighbor. It's the person that is going through your mind right now, the person's face that you see right now. It's one person at a time. This is how we actually change the world. One person at a time. If we are all doing this, what happens? What happens? Listen, maybe this morning this is for you. Maybe until now you have thought you were fine. But it's at this moment that you realize you do not see. You have not seen. You've been blind spiritually. Is this you? Maybe you're watching online. Is this you? Right now is the moment to recognize that, confess that, admit that, turn to Christ and be saved. Right now, it's you. One life. All of heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. And here is your opportunity. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy, your goodness, and your kindness, your love. I thank you, Lord, that you see one person in the midst of a crowd. And this morning, Lord, there may be one person in the midst of this group of people, in the midst of the crowd that is watching online. There may be one person, Lord, and you see. I pray, Lord, you'd help them to turn to you now. Is that you this morning? Would you be willing to admit to God that you have been blind, that you have not seen, that you have not known Him, that you have been dead? Would you be willing to admit it this morning? Every person who would be saved must do that. If that's you this morning, you're ready to turn to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Understand that He's listening to you. He sees you. He has found you. Talk to Him. He's listening right now. Admit to Him that you are a sinner. Admit to Him that you need Him to save you. Ask Him to do it. Ask Him to forgive your sin. Ask Him to save you. Ask Him to come and be the Lord and King of your life. And thank Him for what He did. What He did on that cross. Lord, we thank You. We love You. We thank You for what You have done. Lord, we give our hearts and our lives to you. We thank you that we were once blind, but now we see you, the light of the world. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.